So in the third video in our series on building a circuit on a physical breadboard based on a circuit diagram, we will be introducing several new circuit components, including a transistor, a potentiometer, and a symbol we haven't seen yet, the ground symbol. So remember that there are a couple previous videos in this series that cover the basics. If this looks too confusing and you haven't watched those videos yet, you can find them linked in the description below this one. So here I have added all of the parts I'm going to need to build this circuit off to the side of the breadboard. And as in previous videos, I'll walk you through the process of, okay, how do I decide how to organize these parts on the breadboard so they match this diagram? And one thing you might be wondering first is, well, wait a minute, how did you know, for example, that this is a transistor or that this is a potentiometer? Well, I already knew what these symbols meant. And then here in Tinkercad, it gives you this nice label that tells you, for example, this is a potentiometer. But if you see a symbol that you don't recognize, you're probably gonna need to go look up a general reference, for example, on the inside cover of an electrical engineering textbook, or just Google a reference for circuit diagram symbols. For example, SparkFun has a nice one here where they have a big list of switches and what all the symbols mean. So if you see an unidentified symbol that you're not sure what it is, go look up a reference like this and find the name for the physical part. Then if you're working in Tinkercad, you can search for it or find it over here on the right or if you're working with a physical kit, you can find that part in your kit. So first let's get our discussion of the ground symbol out of the way. We haven't seen this before, and this symbol is usually used in more complex diagrams just to indicate that all of these points are connected to the common ground in the circuit. Particularly for large messy diagrams, it can get a little annoying to draw a single line all the way back to a ground point. So in this particular diagram, it's not a big deal for me to connect all of these, but you can imagine some much bigger circuit where I have multiple things connected to ground all over the place, and you don't want to have to draw one line connecting them all. So it is implied, unless stated otherwise, when you see these symbols that they are all connected. Now, note that there are a couple different symbols for ground. We can actually see that if we go here and look at this SparkFun diagram. So depending on the textbook or the website you're looking at, you might see, for example, just a line or a little triangle or these multiple parallel lines. Technically, this symbol is supposed to be reserved for earth ground, so something like building wiring, where you do literally have a wire connected to a metal rod or metal pipe that is inserted in the ground. So you shouldn't really be using this for a battery-powered circuit that does not have that external connection to earth ground, but I think it's pretty common, so I'm just using it here anyway since it's something you'll see a lot elsewhere. But again, this does not literally mean that there's an external connected to ground if you're dealing with a battery-powered circuit or that you need some extra wire connected to something in the case of a simple battery powered circuit like we're going to do, it just means all of these points are connected. So next let's talk about the potentiometer. And you can see the symbol for the potentiometer here has three terminals. So part of it just kind of looks like a regular resistor. And then I've got this little arrow here over on the right. And if I look at my physical potentiometer here in Tinkercad, it also has three terminals. And again, Tinkercad is nice because it labels the terminals for you if you mouse over them. So I have terminal one and terminal two on the outside and the wiper or the movable terminal on the inside. So that's going to adjust the resistance between this wiper and the two outer terminals. And the potentiometer is a case where if I rotate this one 90 degrees, I can see how in this case, the physical pins do kind of line up with the physical arrangement of the pins on the circuit symbol, but that is not always the case. So it's always a good idea to go double check the parts data sheet if you're using a potentiometer in a physical kit. So for example, here I pulled up a potentiometer on SparkFun and I can go over to the data sheet and we see that this thing comes in a handful of different packages. But if I look at the dimension drawings for those packages, it labels the pins one, two, three. And then there's a circuit diagram over here that labels the corresponding pin showing that yes, pins one and pin three, which are also physically the outer pins are the fixed terminals and the wiper or movable terminal is that middle pin, pin two. So transistors can be a little trickier. There are a lot of different types of transistors, which we can see if we go over here to this Wikipedia page and you see all these different symbols. So first you need to identify which one you are looking at. This particular symbol happens to represent an NPN BJT, which has three pins called the base, the collector, and the emitter. Now you're gonna need to look up the data sheet for the specific transistor you have to figure out where those three pins are on the physical part. Again, in Tinkercad, they label those pins for you here, collector, base, emitter, but they're not going to do that on a physical transistor. So you need to go find that transistor, look up that part. Here's my 2N3904. 
and go check the data sheet where I can see that the pins are labeled one, two, three from left to right when viewing the transistor with the flat side facing you. So it has this one flat side and a rounded backside. And then I can see the schematic diagram here. So that is emitter base collector going from left to right on pins one through three. So all that is great. We have gone over all the parts. Let's build the circuit. As usual, I recommend saving connecting the battery for last so you don't accidentally fry something if you have a short circuit or make a mistake when you are assembling things. And this is a case where, again, the physical layout of the circuit on the breadboard really isn't, doesn't necessarily need to match the physical layout of the diagram. So don't start and try to think, okay, I need the transistor here and the potentiometer there and the LED is going to be up here. Don't worry about that. Pick a component to start, choose a location on the breadboard, and then kind of build the circuit in a way that makes sense around that. Again, this circuit is doesn't have too many components, so I should have plenty of space to spread things out and not cram them together on the breadboard. But if you're going to be expanding and adding more stuff, you might want to keep this kind of condensed towards one end of the breadboard to give you more space to expand later. So to get started building the circuit, I am going to pick a component. I'm going to start with the transistor. I'm picking that somewhat arbitrarily. I could have picked the potentiometer. Uh, in general, I would recommend starting with one of the more complex parts that has multiple pins as opposed to something simpler like a resistor or an LED, and then kind of build your circuit around that. So I'm going to pick the transistor, and to start it in the breadboard, remember, don't do this. All of the holes in the row of a breadboard are connected, so all I'm doing there is shorting those pins together. I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees and then make sure each pin is in a different row on the breadboard. Now, I just noticed a slight problem here. The... NPN BJT that is in Tinkercad goes collector base emitter from left to right, whereas I had planned to use this one, which goes emitter base collector from left to right. So this is why it's always important to check your data sheets. So since I am building the circuit in Tinkercad, I am going to go with how these pins are labeled in Tinkercad. So we're just going to say, okay, we're not actually using a 2N3904 there. Tinkercad doesn't give you the part number, so I don't know exactly what this one is, but Again, the symbol, circuit symbol for these is the same, but the physical pinout for this one is different. This one goes collector, base, emitter, as opposed to emitter, base, collector from left to right on this one. So that is why it is always important to check your data sheets because this might not be the same for all transistors. So next I'm going to look at the pins of the transistor and what they are connected to. So I have the emitter down here, that is the bottom pin. And remember, you can go look at a circuit diagram reference if you cannot remember which pin is which because it wasn't labeled here for you. So the emitter is the bottom pin, and that is labeled with the E here in Tinkercad. That is just connected to ground. Remember that, again, this ground symbol just indicates connection to a common ground, which on the breadboard I'm going to use my ground bus for. So I'm just going to add a single jumper wire there. Next, the base is connected to my 1 kilo ohm resistor, which I have already set up here. And here I have a choice kind of as which way I'm going to go ahead and put that on the breadboard. Now, we talked in a previous video how I could kind of put the resistor somewhere else and use a jumper wire to connect to it like that. So now I have a path for current through the resistor, through this row of the breadboard, and through this wire to the transistor. Or I could skip that jumper wire entirely and just put the resistor like this. So this end of the resistor is connected directly to the base of the transistor sort of becomes up to you in terms of how neat things are on your breadboard and how compact you want things to be overall. And then finally, I have the collector of the transistor connected to the negative side or cathode of the LED, where again, I'm going to rotate this. So I could just go ahead and put those in the same breadboard row if I decide that is getting too crowded and things are a little too scrunched. Again, on breadboard, you want to be careful with a physical breadboard, these things have some three-dimensional height to them. You don't want these loose leads to bump into each other, or you can get a short circuit. So if you want to space things out more and add a jumper wire, you can do that as well. So I'm going to continue up this branch of the circuit. And again, I don't have to do that. You could build this in whatever order makes sense to you. I'm just showing you one possible order that I think kind of makes sense. So I'm going to continue up this branch of the circuit, and I have a 220 ohm resistor connected to power. So there are multiple ways to do that. I could, if I was working on a physical breadboard, angle this resistor over directly to the power bus. 
that would get a little crowded with how I already have things here in Tinkercad. So I'm going to have my resistor up to a blank row of the breadboard. And then I'm going to use a jumper wire to get over to the power bus. If you kind of like having everything nice and parallel here or at right angles, then that's one way you could do this. Or I could, for example, have moved my LED over here and rotated this resistor 90 degrees and had it go directly to the power bus. Both of those connections are electrically equivalent. It's really just a matter of how you want to physically arrange things depending on how much space you need on the breadboard. So I'm going to keep it like that because it happens to look neat with how I've built things here, but that is not the only way to do it. So with a more complex circuit, here's where you might want to start keeping track or maybe checking off the things you've already added. So I've added the transistor, the LED, and the two resistors. I have not added the potentiometer, and then I already mentioned the final thing I'm going to connect is going to be the battery. So the potentiometer, the middle terminal, or the wiper, needs to go to the free end of this one kilo ohm resistor, and then the other two ends are going to go to power and ground. So as usual, there's more than one way to do that. I could connect this wiper directly to the middle terminal of the resistor, and then I'm going to connect these terminals to power and ground, or I could say, depending on how big your physical potentiometer is, oh no, that's a little too crowded, I want to move the potentiometer down here to give it some space, and then I'm going to use a jumper wire to connect this breadboard row to the wiper. Either way works. In this case, in Tinkercad at least, these fit snugly next to each other, I'm not overlapping my transistor. So I'm going to go ahead and put that right there to minimize the number of jumper wires that I need. Now, the potentiometer is symmetric, so technically it doesn't matter which one of these I connect to power and which one I want to ground. That's just going to reverse the clockwise or counterclockwise behavior of the potentiometer, as we'll see in a minute. So I'm just going to pick, say, I'm going to connect terminal 1 over to power and terminal 2 to ground, change that over to a black wire. Again, we usually use red for power and black for ground. And finally, last thing I need to do here is connect my six volt power supply. So I'm gonna run the negative terminal from my battery to the ground bus and the positive terminal from the battery to the power bus. In this case, I haven't actually used the right side of my breadboard at all. So I didn't bother connecting the left and right side power buses, but that is good practice in general if you're going to be building a more complicated circuit or expanding your circuit to make sure you have power available everywhere. So I'm going to throw those wires in just in case I decide to move something or add more stuff later. And now I'm going to run my simulation. And what I didn't mention that we've actually built here earlier is an LED dimmer where we are controlling the current through this LED using the potentiometer and the transistor. So the circuit theory behind that is a topic for another video. You can kind of take my word for it for now, but what we should see when we start the simulation is that we can use the potentiometer to change the brightness of the LED. So I just kind of handpicked resistor values here. I didn't really bother with the calculations, but why isn't Tinkercad letting me click on the potentiometer anymore? Come on. So oh, there we go. Had a little bit of lag in Tinkercad, but again, I can use this potentiometer to twist it and adjust the current through the base of the transistor and the resulting current through the LED. And again, this is just one way to build the circuit. There is really no right or wrong way to do this. So this was pretty spread out. Let's very quickly, I'm not going to walk through the process as step by step this time, but let's say I want to start over and rearrange this to be as compact as possible. I really want to squish this into one corner of the breadboard so I can have lots of space to build something else. So I am going to start with the transistor again, since I kind of view that as the central component of this circuit. Say I'm going to put the transistor as close as I can get up to the top of the board there. And I'm going to put my LED. So the LED is just connected directly to the transistor, which I didn't do last time. And then I have my 220 ohm current limiting resistor that I'm going to try and rotate and see if I can get that. See if Tinkercad will let me get this at exactly the right angle. Okay, Tinkercad doesn't let me get it at exactly the right angle here. So let's say I'm going to move everything down one row. So now I've, I've saved myself from using any jumper wires there. If you look at the diagram, I have six volts to the resistor, to the LED, to the collector of the transistor. And I have that same thing here. Six volts to the resistor, to the LED, which is in the same row, to the collector of the transistor. So nice and compact with no jumper wires required. Same thing there. I'm going to add my one kilo ohm resistor. Again, I'm just going to add that directly to the base of the LED, of the transistor 
And if I do that, I'm kind of going to be building down on this left-hand side of the breadboard, which works if I want to save space to build something over here on the right. Another option, something I didn't really show before, we could also choose to build across to the right-hand side of the breadboard. So let's show that too. So I'm going to move the transistor over. And in real life, take, this transistor would kind of be pointing straight up and obscuring these holes on the breadboard. Tinkercad kind of shows this quasi three-dimensional view. So we'll see if it lets me snap this resistor. There we go. It still lets me put it in this hole on the breadboard that's technically behind the transistor and it's showing the transistor on top. I'm not sure if there's really layers or a way for me to bring that up. So it looks a little weird there, but you get the idea that I'm going across the breadboard instead. And then I'm also going to add my potentiometer where, again, these parts are kind of going to physically overlap each other a bit here. I have this middle wiper is connected to the terminal of that one kilo ohm resistor, as shown in the diagram here. And then I'm going to connect the outer terminals to power and ground. So there's an example of if I kind of wanted to keep this all very smushed to the top of the breadboard and save lots of space to build something at the bottom, that's kind of cramming it in very tightly up there in just a few rows. But again, all of this, if you trace out the connections, is electrically equivalent, and it looks a little weird in Tinkercad since these parts are overlapping each other, but in a three-dimensional circuit, these parts would be sticking up out of the breadboard. So that is it for this tutorial. Again, you can find previous videos in this series linked in the description below this one, and in the next video, we will check out operational amplifiers and integrated circuits.